Welcome to a four-part mini-series on Mashiach, the Messiah, and the Messianic Redemption. I'm Pinchas Taylor. Thanks for joining us. The premise of Mashiach's coming, the Messianic era, is that godliness is not openly apparent, and we want godliness to be openly apparent. To get the general idea of what Mashiach's coming is all about, we have to preface with some key Jewish concepts. Number one, Jewish tradition teaches that God created the world in order to bestow kindness, in order to allow another entity to experience himself, who is the ultimate good. Practically, that means that God desired a dwelling place, a place where godliness could be expressed in the physical world, that even the place that was created to obscure godliness would itself reveal godliness. This happens through beings who have free will choosing to do what's right according to the Torah and bypassing the lusts and drives of the physical world. The ultimate goal is when the world itself reflects godliness where God's will, as it's described in the Torah, is expressed clearly and that physical existence reveals spirituality as opposed to concealing it. So Judaism holds the idea of Mashiach and the coming of the Messiah and the Messianic Redemption as a key fundamental idea. If you take a look in text number one, you'll see from the Rambam, the famed medieval sage Maimonides, who says that it's not only a core belief of Judaism to believe in the coming of Mashiach, but that even if it takes a long time, that we're supposed to await his coming every single day. If we take a look at text number two, we can, we can read it together. It says, in the future, the Messianic king will arise and renew the David dynasty, restoring it to its initial sovereignty. He will build the temple and gather the dispersed of Israel. Then, in his days, the observance of all the statutes will return to their previous state. We will offer sacrifices, observe the sabbatical and, and, ju and jubilee years, according to their particulars as described by the Torah. This is going to be an era of world peace when the sole occupation of the world is going to be to know God. The Lubavitcher Rebbe points out that this idea, one of the reasons that Mashiach and the coming of the Messianic Redemption is so key to Judaism, is that Torah and mitzvahs, Torah and its commandments, will be allowed to express themselves in their totality when, when the Mashiach arrives. Certain commandments are only applicable once Mashiach and that messianic era is instated. For example, expanding the, the three cities of refuge that the Torah prescribes. Also, certain commandments regarding the sacrifices and the temple are only relative when Mashiach is here, when there's a temple built. The Chafetz Chaim, a famed 20th century sage, early 20th century, set, calls the coming of Mashiach and belief in his arrival the principle of principles, meaning a core value in Judaism. Jewish literature is replete with the idea that it's a great mitzvah, it's a great commandment, obligation to await Mashiach's arrival. Not just believe that he's coming, but also to await. If you take a look at text number four, we'll see that the anticipation is one, of the act, is one of the things that a person is asked upon their entrance into the next world. Meaning the person lives their entire life and before they enter into the pearly gates of heaven, they are asked a few questions regarding the totality of their life. Take a look at text number four. We see from the Talmud, Rava said, at the moment that a person is brought before the heavenly court, they say to him, did you deal honestly in business? Did you have set times for learning Torah? Did you engage in producing children? And the fourth question is, did you anticipate the coming salvation, the coming of Mashiach? So it's a requirement, a fundamental pillar of our faith to await Mashiach's coming and not only to believe in him, but to actually await and anticipate. The idea of Mashiach's coming and a redemption that comes along with that 
to appreciate the significance of what that means, we have to appreciate the fact that the Jewish people are in exile and have been so for nearly 2,000 years. Exile means that the Jewish people are unable to dwell in the land of Israel in a society that's based on the precepts of the Torah as it once was and instead are subject to foreign rule from foreign societies and ideologies. The concept of exile remains even with the foundation of the modern state of Israel because from a Torah perspective, exile is a state of mind and a state of being, not exclusively a geographical location. Therefore, exile can occur even when the Jewish people are living in Israel. In fact, that's exactly what happened during the Greek exile, when the Jewish, which culminated with the, with the miracles of Hanukkah. The Jews were living in the land of Israel at the time, yet still subject to a Greek exile. There have been several exiles in Jewish history, but the current exile, which is, has been the longest and um, perhaps the harshest, began with the destruction of the Second Temple nearly 2,000 years ago. This idea of world peace and just uh, godliness revealing itself, it sounds nice, but my, many might be quick to, to think that the world community is really far from the messianic ideal, and it's very difficult to see it, such a change happen anytime soon. However, situations in the world can change very rapidly, be they personal changes, communal changes, national changes, global changes. One need only look at Europe and how the entire world was transformed uh, in the early 1930s and 40s for the negative. From a positive vantage point, when one looks at the Torah, back to the first exile, the exile in Egypt, one finds a very rapid change of pace as well. The exile in Egypt, the slavery in Egypt, was the, the pipeline, the stage setter, the paradigm to which all exiles and redemptions are modeled after. In a matter of 10 months, this slave nation, which was entrenched in excruciating labor with no sense of salvation, went from oppression to triumph and was liberated and decimated the greatest superpower at the time. One sees this transformation on a small scale in the Bible with the story of Joseph in prison. One day, Joseph is in an Egyptian dungeon, and through his ability to meaningfully interpret Pharaoh's dreams, he becomes the viceroy, the ruler of all Egypt, an overnight change for the better. So he starts off in a very low place, which doesn't seem like there's any hope, any salvation, he interprets Pharaoh's dream, and he goes from the ultimate imprisonment to being basically the king over the entire nation, with the snap of a finger. When we look around and we hear news reports about negativity growing and, and bad stuff happening in the world, we have to remember that from a biblical perspective, it says that God creates the world, everything that exists in it, Zeh le'umat zeh, which means one thing opposite the other. Which means that good and evil exist simultaneously and proportionately. When we see negativity prevail in the world, we have to know that on the other side of the scale, there is a lot of positivity happening as well. It just might not be as openly apparent or reported. So the redemption really could happen at any moment. When we see bad things happening in the world and we hear lots of bad things going on in the world, we have to know that on the other side of the spectrum, there, there is a growing sense of good going on as well. Just our media, bad things happen to sell. So because of the importance and the centrality of Mashiach's coming, we pray for redemption every single day, multiple times a day. If you take a look at, at uh, text number five, we're going to learn through, through this course that Mashiach, the Messiah, has to be a descendant of King David. And the Jewish people ask for him many times every day. Text 5 is from the Shmona Ezra, the Amida, a prayer said by Jewish people around the world three times a day. And one of the prayers that we say in the 15th blessing is that may you speedily cause the offspring of your servant David to flourish. We ask for Mashiach to come 
as soon as possible. In some of the, in some of the liturgies of even the Kaddish, which you could see in text 6, it also asks that God bring Mashiach speedily, that he hasten Mashiach's coming. Mashiach is the purpose of the world. It's the culmination, the pinnacle, where godliness is able to openly express itself even in our physical world. The world today, if we look around, seems to be running without God. It looks like that this world is a world of chaos that functions without any order, and certainly without any godliness. This was a result of the sin of Adam in the Garden of Eden. Rabbi Eliyahu Zessler, a famous uh, early 20th century sage, brings this idea in a very clear way. He says that before the sin of, uh, of Adam and Eve, Adam was on a level where he was living in the Garden of Eden, which means that his awareness of reality was that creation is spiritual and physicality is just mere clothing that's hiding the true reality, which is the spirit. When Adam sinned, he brought the evil inclination into his being. He brought the world down into a state of spiritual obscurity where it appears that physicality is the real, is the real world uh, and it's the true nature of its existence. The goal, our goal throughout world history has been to bring the world to a state which openly perceives godliness. Bring it back to that original state where godliness is openly apparent and will stay that way forever. The Jewish mystics, the Kabbalists, in particular Rabbi Isaac Luria, the, the Arizal, who was founder of Lurianic Kabbalah in the 16th, in the 16th century, explains that the spiritual refinement is what leads to the arrival of Mashiach. Beyond the physical reality, if we look around in the world, beyond the physical, every physical thing is constructed of sparks of godliness. The commandments of the Torah are all about human interaction, human interface with those hidden sparks. In certain objects or situations, the godly spark is accessible, while in others, it's not accessible. So when the Torah says something is prohibited, it uses the word asur. It means it's forbidden, it is prohibited. Asur also means it is bound and it is tied, which means that the godly sparks that are contained in that object or situation are not something that can be uplifted and elevated. On the other hand, when the Torah says that something is permissible, it says mutar, mutar means permissible. And the idea is that the spiritual energy that's contained in that object or in that situation can be elevated through the mitzvah. We uplift the sparks, we uplift and we transform that physical entity into a spiritual reality. That is what the whole interface of mitzvahs on the world is all about. When we do commandments, we transform objects and situations into godly objects and godly experiences, transforming all of time and space into a godly reality. When all of the sparks of the world are uplifted, the messianic redemption will be underway. When Mashiach comes, there will be no obstruction of the godly perspective of the world. Currently, there is godliness in existence, yet this element is concealed. It's veiled by our perception of the physical world, by a human being's perception of reality. Currently, mankind views the physical universe as an entity in its own right, rather than a mere expression of the divine plan. The change in perception will be natural when Mashiach comes. A good analogy, to if you want to really get an idea of what the difference between now and when Mashiach comes will really be all about, imagine a cow who's looking at a work of art, a cow looking at a painting on the wall. So when the cow sees it, he sees colors, he sees images, but when the cow sees the painting, the painting is devoid of any value, any depth, or of any meaning. If a professor of art examines that same painting, examines that same masterpiece, it's a world of difference. 
he sees, he's seeing the same object, he's seeing the same colors and strokes, but what he sees is a world of difference from the cow. The colors that the painting de depicts something that was going on in the artist. The stroke style that the artist chose to use also shows something that was going on in the artist. So the color scheme, the strokes, whether the painting is abstract or realistic, all show something about the artist. They're all expressing a detail about the artist who made it. If someone's truly an expert, the painting becomes a window into the soul of the artist who painted it. 